This is lecture 93 in the ABCs of Communism series. Uh, these lectures are the first in a series that will be supporting volume 7, uh, Communism in Europe. And uh, last time we did uh, Iberia, this time we're going to move on to France. And the lower Paleolithic uh, stone tools discovered in 2009 at Lezinan La Sebe Cave indicate that early humans were present in France at least 1.57 million years ago. This should remind us that as Marxists we should always be thinking of the causation behind the selection process for Homo to evolve continuously in one direction, that is toward improved brains in order to one, better control the environment around society with culture, and by culture we of course mean by the forces of production and relations of production upon which arise the superstructure of cognition. In contemporary anthropological terms, we are thinking about the mode of production, that is technology and social organization, and the ideology arising thereon, and two, that people had to do this without creating surplus social product that would encourage envy, jealousy, and coveting that would then destroy social unity. The secret of the human way was collective tool using labor and self-awareness and thinking about their world. These two goals had to be maintained simultaneously if the species were to survive. This was the underlying causal reality of primitive communism, and primitive, prehistoric primitive communism was our condition for many millions of years. We have seen that once the Homo australopithecus grade was established in Africa, that people doubled their brain capacity and thus evolved into Homo erectus. Homo erectus spread soon into Europe and Asia, and despite, despite migrating over thousands of miles, did not speciate as other biological organisms would. Why was this so? Because selection was operating primarily in favor of the ability to use culture and achieving the two aforementioned processual objectives. Thus in Europe, as in Asia, selection was operating uniformly to make the human brain capability even great, uh, greater, creating Homo sapiens with a variety of phenotypic forms. Dialectical and historical materialism teaches us that there were never competing species of Homo. On the other hand, there were and are many outward or phenotypic forms, that is, races, of Homo sapiens. Let's begin with the Handax world, the road to Abbeville. In 1830, a French customs officer named Boucher de Perthes was pursuing his hobby of recovering prehistoric animal bones from the gravels of the Somme Valley. There he found stone tools that indicated evidence of human alteration. They were in association with remains of elephant and rhinoceros in the gravels of Mencia Court. In 1847, he commenced publication of his monumental three-volume work, uh, Celtic Antiqu uh, Antediluvian Celtic Antiquities in English, establishing the existence of humans in the Pleistocene. In 1855, Dr. Marcel Jerome Rigolot of Amiens concurred in the human created authenticity of the flint implements that de Perthes had stored at Abbeville, France. In 1858, the then famous Scottish scientist Hugh Falconer saw the collection at Abbeville and invited Joseph Prestwich in the following year to visit the locality. Prestwich agreed that the flint implements were of human origin and in association with extinct mammalian fauna. Charles Lyell confirmed the ancient temporal assignment and went further by pointing out that the Chac Plateau of Picardy, France had once been connected to chalklands of Kent, England. The Dover Strait, or Pas de Calais, he said, was the recent result of very long-term complex erosion forces. In 1882, Professor Louis Laurent Gabriel de Mortillet from the School of Anthropology in Paris published his La Prehistoric, The Prehistoric Antiquity of Man in English, being the first to characterize periods by the name of a site. Many of his names are still in use. His first two were Chelian and Achillian. Today the hand axes of the Somme River District are dated to well over one million years and therefore were made by Homo erectus. And since Lewis and Mary Leakey's work at Olduvai Gorge, it has become increasingly popular to refer to the findings from the Somme Valley as early Olduvai. I think the easiest way for budding Marxist-Leninist prehistorians to absorb the data is to think of much of the old world 
as having been a planet of the Handax people from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Accordingly, we shall be looking at first tools of Homo erectus after the Kafuan and Oldowan periods in East Africa as the time when the Earth was the planet of the Handax. The French Paleolithic includes the early Handax site materials at Abbeville and the other early Handax assemblages originally called Chelian and Achulian of Homo erectus. These people of the lower Paleolithic became Homo sapiens by one million years ago in our schema and the still somewhat arbitrary, arbitrary point of transition when we say Erectus becomes sapiens of one million years ago is nicely represented at the site of Grot du Valle near Menton. It contains simple stone tools dating 1.05 million to one million years BP. Handax World By 700,000 years ago, electron spin resonant date, to 450,000 years ago, an adjusted thermoluminescence date, human fossils remains are found in France at the Arago Cave in Tatavelle. There, the male skull of a Homo sapiens form in cranial capacity of 1,150 cubic centimeters, well within the Homo sapiens range on the early end, was found. In 2017, a study shows two distinct stratigraphic Acheulean levels dated respectively at 700 and 500,000 BP. The investigators in their May 2017 report conclude it is likely that by the time the Acheulean arrived in Europe, its makers were from a cognitive and motor control point of view already capable of producing the symmetric variant of this technology. And for their illustrations, one can see the assemblages in the report, quote, high and symmetry at the beginning of the European Acheulean, the data from La Noire of France in context. And there are some more references which I give there to the same illustrations. Now, stages of Acheulean technology. In stage 1 and Mode 1 industries involve producing flake tools by hitting a suitable stone with a hammer stone. The resulting flake that broke off would have a natural sharp edge for cutting and could after, afterwards be sharpened further by striking another smaller flake from the edge if necessary. And that is what archaeologists call retouch. These early tool makers shaped the stone from which the flake was removed, and such shaped stones are called cores, and themselves are used as chopping tools. Mode 2, Acheulean tool makers also used the Mode 1 flake tool method, but supplemented it by using bone, antler, or wood to retouch stone tools. This type of hammer compared to stone yields more control over the shape of the finished tool. Unlike the earlier Mode 1 industries, the core was prized over the flakes that came from it. Another advance was that the Mode 2 tools were worked symmetrically and on both sides, indicating greater care in the production of the final tool. Mode 3 technology emerged toward the end of the Lower Paleolithic, a Chulian dominance. It involved the Level Wa technique, where a round shaped core had a tortoise shell flake removed superiorly, and flakes then removed at right angles to the surface all around the core. It was perfected in the following Mysterian Industries period. At any rate, it is well established archaeologically that humans in France were shaping spruce and pine wood into javelins to hunt large mammals, and this almost exclusively. It was such a successful strategy that people had a lot of time on their hands if they were to avoid creating excess social product. Some of that time was spent in cogitating over and discussing various aspects of the world they knew, which is to say the living and non-living resources within their environment. As people gained more knowledge, it was inevitable that they would expand their subsistence strategy bank to include the broader spectrum of animal and plant life, and indeed they did. We know this because the archaeological record in the later Lower Paleolithic is replete with the remains of smaller creatures. A case in point is the Nice French site at Terra Amata. Here we have Acheulean tools and excavations um, at Terra Amata, where we have traces of the earliest fireplace in Europe at 400,000 BP. An important feature of the Terra Amata site is the appearance of a broader spectrum of wild resource exploitation than just large game hunting. This is proof, proof of preparation for the Mysterian technological revolution 
with its hundreds of specialized tool types for a variety of usages. And that takes us to the middle Paleolithic Mysterian technology. Now what is important about the Mysterian? We can begin by clarifying that what is not important are the physical features of the people who made the tools. Why is this so? Firstly, the phenotypic facial physicality is by definition unimportant in sociocultural evolutionary terms. Among Homo, the cubic centimeter cranial capacity is the one diagnostic physical feature. Secondly, we have evidence of Mysterian stone, bone, and wood industries all over the old world in association with a broad spectrum of facial phenotypes. And finally, we have the history of anthropological theorizing about the Mysterian. That history shows us the first investigators to have been dilettantes from Europeans, European ruling classes. Accordingly, people whose prejudices about the importance of their descendants' facial characteristics being similar to their own determine their attitudes to classification. So, in short, we can shit can all this Neanderthal versus Cro Magnon crap. Now, as for the dating, the Middle Paleolithic spans the period from 300,000 to 30,000 years ago. The predominant industry of the latter part of this era, era is termed the Mousterian, named for its type site, Le Moustier, a rock shelter in Dordogne, France. Le Moustier is an archaeological site consisting of two rock shelters in the Pesac Le Moustier, a village in the Dordogne of France. The Mousterian tool culture is named after Le Moustier, which was first excavated in 1863 by the Englishman Henry Christie and the Frenchman Edouard Larte. In France, the Mousterian industry spanned the period from 160,000 BP to 35,000 or 30,000 BP. And other important Mousterian sites in France are Abrique Romani, Saint Césaire, and Grata du Noistier. Now, the Mousterian technology. The Mousterian stone tool production type is considered a technological step forward, consisting of a transition from lower Paleolithic handheld Acheulean hand axes to hafted tools. Hafted tools are stone points or blades mounted on wooden shafts and yielded, wielded as spears, or perhaps in a bow and arrow combination. A typical Mysterian stone tool assemblage is primarily defined as a flake-based tool kit making use of the level wall technique rather than later blade-based tools. Flakes are variably shaped thin flake stones napped off a core. Blades are like flakes, but at least twice as long as their widths and struck off a prepared platform surface. Their removal is parallel to each other, exhibiting a dorsal ridge left over from a preceding blade removal. Level wall flakes come from preforms, and preforms are stones shaped from which flakes can be removed for making a variety of scraping, cutting, and puncturing implements. These raw flakes were then modified for particular uses by systematic percussion flaking of their edges. Mousterian flake knives, made in this way, were used for such tasks as cutting small pieces of wood and butchering animals. Flake scrapers were important in processing animal skins. Level wall flakes were used to make unifacial spear projectile points. The stone projectile points were affixed to spears. Stone tipped spears, as opposed to fire hardened wooden tips, allowed greater penetration of the spears for the effective killing of large animals. Part of the Mysterian assemblage is made of level wall tools, such as projectile points and cores. The tool kit varies from place to place and from time to time. In the Middle Paleolithic, not all sites had the same tool kits. Specialized local tasks had resulted in tool variations within the Mysterian tool making tradition. This new technology was part of their emerging broad spectrum wild resource hunting and gathering. The Mysterian tool kit featured through time reduction in the use of large core tools such as hand axes, and specialized flake tools became more common. Blocks or cobbles of flint and other brittle fracturing rock were percussion flaked on one side until a convex tortoise shell shape was formed. Then a heavy percussion blow at one end of the core removed a large flake that was convex on one side and relatively flat on the other. That is a classical level wall flake. This technique was first used 300,000 years ago and was perfected in the Mousterian toolkit. 
The following are the principal types. The Mousterian point and convergent scraper, which is a short, broad, triangular projectile point, or scraper flakes struck from prepared cores. Level wall flakes with retouch are sub-oval, sub-quadrangular, triangular, or leaf-shaped flakes struck from cores. Normally, these would have been retouched, that is to say a series of small, purposeful flakes removed from the flake, creating an edge which is either sharper for cutting or blunted to make it safe to hold. And level wall blades, elongated, oval, or rectangular blanks removed from cores with basal preparation and correction of the core convexity. And finally, level wall cores include two types, the pebble and bipolar. Pebble cores are stones from which flakes have been detached by percussion. Bipolar cores are those created by placing a stone on a hard surface, an anvil, and striking it from above with a hard percussor. Large biface core tools, such as hand axes, continued to be part of the Mousterian toolkit. However, they were much more carefully and extensively worked than in the Acheulean tradition. Small flake scars on many of the Mousterian hand axes suggest that the craftsmen were using hammers of bone, antler, or wood for better control in the final stages of shaping. Their spear points and knives were set in wooden handles, as were their scrapers, pronged harpoons, and engraving tools. By 110,000 years ago, they fashioned tools for cutting meat, cracking open bones, and working wood using a fixed blade on a handle. They made stone scrapers with a bone hammer and used it to carve meat off of reindeer bones. Many tools began as carefully shaped stone cores that became primary, primary use tools, although flakes struck in their shaping were made into various kinds of tools as well. The earliest tools of this kind were found at the Le Moustier site in southwest France. A few comments on their social organization and ideology. The information that can be gleaned from Middle Paleolithic sites indicate that these were bands of about 12 to 24 people that formed kinship alliances with 10 to 20 other bands. The division of labor was by sex and age. Band members unable to provide for themselves were fed and cared for by the group. The La Chapelle of Saint Man lived to well beyond the normal life expectancy of 30 to 35 years. He was 40 to 50 years old and had severe crippling arthritis and it would have made walking difficult. In addition, he would have been limited to soft foods or other people chewed his food for him because he only had two remaining teeth. It is likely that his last years were made possible only because others were compassionate and provided food and protection for him. The same pattern of group support for those unable to take care of themselves is found at Iraq Shanador Cave where a man carefully buried in a ritual manner had major orthopedic problems. Crushing injuries earlier in life resulted in multiple broken bones. This apparently caused degenerative joint disease, the withering of one of his arms, and blindness in one eye. Like the La Chapelle of Saints man, he would have been severely handicapped, yet he lived from 30 to 45 years. To do this, he must have had considerable support. People lived during glacial and interglacial times using animal hides and furs to keep warm as needed. In winter, bearskin coats were popular. To tan buckskin, fur and inner hides were painstakingly scraped off and soaked in pulverized deer brains, and then wrung, stretched, and hung to dry. Waterproofing could be achieved by smoking. Middle Paleolithic people lived in cliffside caves too high and inaccessible to be inhabited by dangerous animals. In one such cave, archaeologists have found a four-walled structure built from rock in the back. In caves one located, uh, once located, people stayed for long periods without changing homes during the year. On the other hand, there were some seasonally secondary campsites appropriately situated in their hunting and gathering strategy. A post hole for a teepee house has been found at a site in southern France. Such structures were made with wood, mammoth bones, and animal hides. People made stone-lined fire pits with hearths of earth and stone, and more advanced tools were, were backed so they could fit snugly into the hand behind the index finger, 
which is used for leverage. Axes were made with notches for the thumbs and fingers. By the end of the Middle Paleolithic, people added sophisticated tools with shafted points and handles. These are common in chattel Peronian technology and in Aurignacian blade tools named after the French site of Aurignac. Uh, these they consisted of blades and advanced bone tools. Curvetting tools included handheld spears, which made the hunting of large animals more feasible. Many of the sites where Aurignacian tools are found also contain art in the form of sculpture or cave paintings. Describing a sophisticated axe, French archaeologist Jean-Michel Jeunesse told National Geographic, quote, this was a multi-purpose tool. Different edges of it were used for different purposes, cutting, butchering, butchering, scraping, and defleshing. It was the Swiss army knife of its day. We might detect 300 scars on an axe, each made during its shaping. Explaining how there is more to making Neanderthal tools than meets the eye, French archaeologist Jacques Pellegrin told National Geographic, quote, you need a lot of brains for flint napping. It would be like playing chess for us. You have to plan and organize how you're going to flake off each piece from the core ahead of time. Rocks are never standard. You have to adjust for differences. Flint breaks under certain conditions, and you have to learn those. It takes months, if not years, to learn to do it well. I have worked flint for 15 years now, and I can say the techniques used by Neanderthals are no less difficult than those used by modern humans." Unquote. Tour de France. People ate large animals such as cave bears, large, long-horned wild oxen called aurochs, bison, elk, and even woolly mammoths that they hunted collectively. They consumed edible plants, shellfish, rabbits, tortoises, and small, small reptiles, as well as rotting carcasses. Bones from immature bunk seals hunted during the summer, along with common and bottle-nosed dolphins, shellfish, and mollusks, are found associated with Mousterian tools in caves at a 30,000-year-old site on a beach in Gibraltar. This proves that they had graduated to broad-spectrum wild resource exploitation. However, they had a ways to go to avoid seasonal dietary deficiencies. Studies of the growth of tooth enamel by Eric Trinkaus of Washington University found that more than 70% of the fossils he studied showed one brush with starvation. This is not surprising considering that each individual needed 5,000 calories a day, almost what cyclists competing in the Tour de France burn each day. To achieve this end, some scientists believe Middle Paleolithic people needed to hunt large and medium-sized game such as horses, deer, bine, bison, and wild cattle. Now, the French archaeologist Alain, Alain Tufreau told National Geographic, quote, many of the bones belong to young adult aurochs. They were very strong and dangerous. Animals of that age do not normally die together in such large numbers. For humans to kill such big animals before bows and arrows were invented, they needed a group and a strategy, unquote. People had wide shoulders, hips, and generally had a body that was more suited for short, powerful burst than for endurance running, which has led some scientists to theorize they were primarily ambush hunters. Based on evidence of wounds and injuries and large numbers of healed fractures found on people's upper limbs and skulls, we think goring was probably a relatively common occurrence. These people used stone projectile points to attack their prey directly by thrusting knives and spears instead of throwing spears at them. Scientists hypothesized they relied more on thrusting weapons because they mostly hunted in dense forests where setting up ambushes and fighting at close quarters makes more sense than throwing spears through forests. Quote, Surrounding and confusing prey is a classic predatory tactic, Steve Kuhn of the University of Arizona told National Geographic, Quote, a few cooperating hunters could have exploited natural landscape features like bogs and deep stream banks that put large animals at a disadvantage. They probably killed at close range with wooden spears that perhaps had a sharp stone point. Unquote. Wooden spears were used in Europe since 400,000 BP. Now, Middle Paleolithic humans no doubt lived hard lives, suffering from a wide range of ailments 
including pneumonia and malnourishment. Few survived beyond the age of 30. On the other hand, they took good care of one another to the degree that they could. This is attested by the care routinely taken with the elderly we see from all areas. In May 2007, in an article published on the website of the newspaper El País, reported that two molars of a 63,400-year-old uh, human skeleton indicated they practiced dental hygiene. The tooth, or the teeth, unearthed in the Pinal del Valle near Madrid have, quote, grooves formed by the passage of a pointed object, which confirms the use of a small stick for cleaning the mouth, unquote, according to Professor Juan Luis Oswonga. Now, in the Upper Paleolithic of France, uh, which begins 43,000 years ago. During a long interglacial period, there was a particularly mild climate. France was relatively warm and food was plentiful. Their broad spectrum wild resource exploitation strategy was so successful that they had a great deal of time they needed to dump into anything and everything that would not produce daily surplus. So sculpture, engraving, painting, body ornamentation, music, and the painstaking decoration of utilitarian objects became the destination for some of that time. Some of the oldest works of art in the world, such as the cave paintings at Lascaux in southern France, are datable to this period. European Paleolithic cultures are divided into several cultures. The names are based on French type sites, principally in the Dordogne region. In chronological order, they are the Arg Nation from 38,000 to 23,000 BP, where we have Venus figurines, cave paintings at the Chauvet Cave that continued during the Gravettian period. The Paragordian from 35 to 20,000 BP um, and implies I'll use, uh, the following sub-periods representing a continuous tradition and I won't go into all of those, but next is the Chattel Peronian from 39 to 29,000 BP, culture derived from the earlier Mysterian industry, as it made use of level walk cores and represents the period when Neanderthals and modern humans occupied Europe together. Uh, Gravetian, that is 28 to 22,000 BP, is responsible for Venus figurines and cave paintings at the Cocaire Cave. And then finally, the Salutrian from 22 to 17,000 BP. And that's followed up by the Magdalenian from 17 to 10,000 BP where we have cave paintings at Peck Mural in the lot in Languedoc, dating as far back as 16,000 BC, that is 18,000 years ago. Lascaux, located near the village of Montignac in the Dordogne, dating between 15,000 and uh, uh, um, uh, 14,000 BP, and perhaps as far back as 27,000 BP. The Troy Frere Caves and the Rofignac Cave, also known as the Cave of the 100 Mammoths. It possesses the most extensive cave system of the Perigord in France, with more than five miles of underground passageways. Experts sometimes refer to the Franco-Cantabrian region to describe this densely populated region of southern France and northern Spain in the late Paleolithic. A few comments on the social life of these people in the settlements which were often located in narrow valley bottoms, possibly associated with hunting of passing herds of animals. Some of them may have been occupied year-round, though more commonly they appear to have been used seasonally. People moved between the sites to exploit different food sources at different times of the year. Hunting was important, and caribou wild reindeer may well be the species of the single greatest importance the entire anthropological in the entire anthropological literature on hunting. Technological advances include significant developments in flint tool manufacturing with industries based on fine blades rather than simpler and shorter flakes, burins, which are engraving tools, and racklars were used to work bone, antler, and hides. Advanced darts and harpoons also appear in this period, along with the fish hook, the oil lamp, the rope, and the eye needle. We Marxists study the Paleolithic record in mode of production and superstructure terms. Life is always local in primitive communist times. Daily life has little formal structure, as becomes evident at excavated camps. After 300,000 years ago, trade or searches for raw material had widened social networks, 
modern human culture from about 35,000 years ago features deliberate burial and art, which aside from expression of worldview, functioned as a labor time dump preventing surplus social product creation. People lived during the Upper Paleolithic in houses, some built of mammoth bone, but most huts were semi-subterranean dugouts with floors, hearths, and windbreaks. Hunting became specialized in sophisticated planning, as shown by the culling of animals, selective choices by season, and selective butchery, the first hunter-gatherer economy. Occasional mass animal killing suggests that in some places, and in some times, food storage was practiced. Some evidence in the different site types of the so-called schlep effect suggests that small groups of people went on hunting trips and returned with meat to the base camps. The first domesticated animals appears during the Upper Paleolithic, and that is the dog, companion to humans for over 15,000 years. Foraging, that is hunting, fishing, and the gathering of wild plant materials, was the universal mode of exi human existence at all times during the Paleolithic. The organization of society was kinship-based. There existed no notion of private property, and social life was communally organized. Paleolithic foragers probably lived in small bands of perhaps 25 to 50 people at the most, and the ethic of sharing was one of the most fundamental principles within and between these groups. These societies had what is known uh, as an immediate return economy where food that was procured, procured during foraging was immediately consumed. More than could be consumed was not sought, and there was no attempt to accumulate a surplus of wealth of any kind. There were no haves or have-nots, no rich or poor, in these societies. There were no homeless people or children, sick or elderly, who did not have communal support networks that took care of them. Foraging societies never developed any kind of state authority or class stratification by definition. Indeed, foraging societies have a strong tendency toward egalitarianism in all aspects of social life, including in gender relations. Generally, the only authority recognized in these societies is the shaman, who is shown, by, shown respect by other members of the society because of her or his recognized abilities in healing and expertise in spiritual matters. While violence undoubtedly existed in Paleolithic societies, there is also little evidence to indicate that systematic warfare existed at any time prior to the Neolithic. With the exception of classes and states and all of the coercive and violent mechanisms that are put into place to protect and expand class and state power, all of the basic human institutions were developed during the Paleolithic. Demographic change is increasingly cited as an explanation for many of the patterns seen in the Paleolithic archaeological record following the assumption of a relationship between population size and material culture espoused by dual inheritance theory. However, the empirical testing of this relationship relies on the ability to extract information about past population records patterns from the archaeological record. Using the extensive and well-studied record of the Upper Paleolithic from 39,500 to 11,500 years ago, uh, hunters and gatherers of southwestern France, as a case study, um, we have evidence for changes in relative population size as seen in three popular archaeological proxies for democratic, demographic change, which are site counts, site sizes, and occupation intensity estimates. These proxies present conflicting results across the sequence, a finding which is explored through the impact of taphonomic biases and past research agendas. Numbers of sheltered sites and quantities of retouched stone tools are suggested to be the most reliable demographic proxies. The problem of equal finality of interpretation in archaeological proxies for demography is examined for the Aurignacian and Gravedian periods in the region with changes in lithic raw material, faunal acquisition strategies, and hunter-gatherer mobility, um, all potentially contributing to the patterns documented. And I won't bother going through that, because I think the important thing is the Upper Paleolithic of southwestern France is an ideal case study for exploring and testing a range of approaches to the 
Paleolithic archaeological record as far as demographics are concerned. And um, there is a broad uniform intensity where chronological and geolo geological terms go to eliminate the problems of sampling and bias with, which often hamper demographic studies. And despite this paleodemographic uh, effort, uh, these efforts are limited and in most part superficial and based, based only on one kind of archaeological data. The specific area of southwestern France uh, chosen for this study centers on the modern administrative Dordogne department and incorporates the six surrounding departments. Um, the area spans about, well, I don't need to go into that, but it's available for occupation was undoubtedly larger in the late Pleistocene and has since been reduced um, by rises in global sea levels and altering coastlines. The study area consisted of a roughly triangular shaped sedimentary basin lying between the middle central to the east, the massif, and then the Pyrenees to the south and the Atlantic Ocean to the west. There a wide range of landscapes are associated uh, in their underlying geology and are present including the Aquitaine Plains, the plateau of the Massif Central, and terraced alluvial valleys, and the coastal region of the Poitou in the north. Two great rivers flow through the region, both of which have numerous tributaries, the Gironde, which runs through the Charente Maritime, Gironde, and Lot et Garonne as it flows north from the Pyrenees before heading northwest, and the Dordogne River, which runs through Corrèze, Lot, Dordogne, and Gironde before joining the Garonne estuary. The dominant geological feature of the region are caves and rock shoulders from which the majority of Upper Paleolithic finds have been recovered, and these occur throughout the study region, but are most common in the Cretaceous limestone dominated landscapes of the Dodone, specifically the Dodone and Vizier valleys in the southeast of France. There we have a landscape of sheltered rivers and coast contrasting limestone plateaus, the topography of which suggests that it has changed very little since the late Pleistocene. The abundance of naturally occurring shelters there is considered to be one of the main factors that favored human occupation of the region through the span of the Upper Paleolithic. The Upper Paleolithic occupation of the region by hunter-gatherer populations occurred in the late Pleistocene from 39,000 500 to 11,500 years ago. Terrestrial and marine climatic proxy records from the region, including speleothem, that is cave, sequences, uh, have sediment profiles, lacustrine pollen sequences, and marine cores from the European Atlantic Ocean margin of both France and nearby northern Iberia. These indicate that the Pleistocene global climatic change had local climatic and environmental effects in southwestern France. Now, archaeologically, the, uh, the Upper Paleolithic of southwestern France is divided into five broad successive periods. The Argnation, 39.5 to 34,000 BP. The Gravetian, from 34 to 26,100 BP. The Seleucian, from 26,100 to 24,600 BP. Magdalenian from 246 to 155 BP, and the Azilian finally from 155 to 11,500 years ago. These five periods show a clear chronological and stratigraphic succession originally identified through the presence of diagnostic lithic type fossils and later by radiometric dates. These phases are divided further into subphases, although ambiguities are present throughout the archaeology chronological sequence as a result of conflicts between absolute dates and stratigraphy and questions surrounding the chronologically diagnostic nature of some type fossils. In view of these ambiguities, simplified subdivision of each of the five periods can be adopted and this simplified archaeological sequence is presented uh, next in this particular chapter and that brings us to a conclusion of our chapter on the upper Paleolithic or on the Paleolithic of primitive communism in France. And next, I believe, we're going to move on to um, lecture 94 on Italy.